Ideas define who we are. Ideas sustain and protect us. They inspire and challenge us. Ideas compel us to take moral action. For generations, the Bet Midrash is where Jewish ideas have been generated, debated, and refined. With more than 100 faculty and fellows and reaching thousands of Jewish learners and leaders, Jewish ideas are not just intellectual. They spark audacious action. The Hartman Institute is reimagining the Jewish people, the state of Israel, and Judaism itself as they should be. Religiously and politically pluralistic. Courageous. Passionate. Hartman empowers Jewish leaders and strengthens our communities. Our ideas shape an agenda for Jewish life in North America and Israel. We hope you'll join us in boldly imagining what comes next for the Jewish people. Welcome to The Conversation. that I've been working on for these, uh, corona, through these corona years. And corona is a, um, is a great friend for a writer. It, uh, it, it keeps you where, you where you should be, which is in your room. And uh, the, the starting point of the book, the book is, is about uh, the meaning of uh, Jewish survival for, for our generation. Uh, the spiritual meaning of Jewish survival. And the starting point of the book is asking the question, how did we get from the lowest point in our history, which was 1945, to what I regard as the peak moment of Jewish history, which is today? And I loved uh, when Yehuda said that uh, these are the best cards we've ever been dealt with, and it may turn out to be a pair of twos, as Yehuda put it, but, uh, but they are the best cards we've ever been dealt with. And the starting point uh, uh, in my book is asking the question, how did we actually do it? Because what we take for granted today, which is this thriving Jewish life, uh, these two extraordinary centers uh, of uh, Jewish vitality uh, with all of the problems that we right, rightfully uh, focus on. But uh, we tend to forget that there's a wider story here. And that story begins uh, the day uh, that the Shoah ends. And the argument that I make in the book is that when we we, is that we need to reconceive of ourselves as a survivor people in the following way. We are not only or even essentially the people that experience the Holocaust, we are the people that defeated the Holocaust, the people that overcame the Holocaust. That is what is relevant to Jewish identity in the 21st century, and we're still the people in, in, our, in our minds, and it's understandable. It takes a long time to process uh, what that was. But we are not, in fact, the people that experience the Shoah anymore. We're the people that defeated the Shoah. And um, so when I come to the question of why Israel, and I'm going to really be offering um, very much of a, a, um, of a position that's filtered through my own personal generational experience. Um, for my generation of American Jews growing up in the 1960s and 70s, uh, the question why Israel did not actually exist. No one asked the question. It was so self-evident that uh, the question itself would have really seemed frankly bizarre. And for me, growing up in a survivor family, I experienced uh, Israel vicariously growing up in Brooklyn uh, in the 1960s. Uh, Israel was, um, was what I would call a vicarious homeland 
it was so present in our home even though we none of us had been there and the notion of traveling to Israel in those years was was still pretty uh, pretty abstract but even though I experienced Israel in, in, in the particular intensity of a Zionist survivor family, um, it was, it was um, my, my general r relationship to Israel, I think was um, the assumption of anyone who took their Jewish identity seriously in America in those years. Israel, Israel was at the center point in one way or another, however it was expressed. And the framing um, concept that American Jewry entirely endorsed was the Zionist slogan, Mishoah Litkuma, from, from destruction to rebirth, to resurrection. And of course, when we thought about Zionism, the immediate uh, response was, well, Zionism saved the survivors. Zionism provided refuge for the survivors. And um, in the immediate aftermath of the Shoah, no one wanted the survivors. It wasn't only during the Shoah that they couldn't find refuge. And we tend to, we tend to forget this and we tend to buy into the profoundly mistaken notion that the world was racked with guilt after the Shoah, and that's why Israel was created. That is actually not what happened, and you can look at the displaced persons camps when the Jews were at the end of the list for American visas, Nazi war collaborators from the Baltics and Ukraine, lo naim lagid, but Ukraine, uh, were, were way ahead of uh, preferential treatment on visa entry into America in 1946, 1947, even 1948. And um, my father had to wait five years for a visa. And, uh, and the war criminals were getting their visas. So this notion of a world that was just so ashamed of the Shoah, it was not sufficiently shamed to keep the Jews not only in DP camps, but in Germany, to keep Jews in camps in Germany through the 40s, through the, through the post-war 40s. And so Zionism, why Israel? Because of the DP camps, because of America's visa policy, because Zionism. Shimon, uh, Yitzhak Shamir, the late uh, uh, prime minister of the Likud, was once asked, and, and a famously laconic man, was once asked in the Knesset, why do you support settlements? And he said, lama kacha, why? Because. <laughs> so that was Zionism. For most American Jews, why? Kacha, because. And if you wanted to go a little bit more philosophical, if you needed some hook to explain your Zionism in a richer way, there was Emil Fackenheim, the, uh, the Jewish philosopher, uh, German Jewish refugee, Canadian Jew, who um, famously coined the phrase, uh, the, the 614th commandment. What was the 614th commandment? Thou shalt not grant a posthumous victory to Hitler, which meant, Jews, you no longer have the right to assimilate. After the Shoah, if you choose to opt out, you are granting a posthumous victory to the Nazis. And, you know, when I read Fackenheim as a teenager, I was blown away. That kind of summed it up. It even created a certain philosophical aura. Now, of course, today, none of that is quite adequate. And it's not adequate not only because there is a passing of the generations and an inevitable rethinking from one generation to the other, but the very notion of Shoah Lit Kuma, from destruction to rebirth, uh, is losing its luster. And it's losing its luster in several ways. First of all, to conceive of Israel as a safe refuge. Well, Israel is not necessarily the safest place in the world to be a Jew. And if Iran goes nuclear, you know, as we say in the Middle East, God is great. 
then really we don't know what will be with the notion of Israel as a safe refuge. Uh, the notion that Israel is the home of last resort for Jewish refugees, well, uh, at the moment we are witnessing a, the reemergence of Jewish refugees in Europe. There's a mass flight of Jews out of Ukraine. Where are they going? Well, some are coming here, but I think more are going to Poland and to Germany. Now, I will let that irony, the, re the renewal of the Jewish people, well, the renewal is morally burdened by 50 plus years of the occupation of another people. And so the renewal, while I believe the renewal is still in full force, it has lost inevitably something of its luster. So in offering my answer to why Israel, which I, I, I will tell you up front is based on the Shoah, I want to go back to 1945, to the day that the camps, the gates to the camps are opened, and the Jewish people is facing the question, what now? And the debate over Zionism that had really torn apart Eastern European Jewry before the Shoah are now over. There is no longer a debate. Even the anti-Zionist Bund, what remains of it, is no longer quite anti-Zionist. They're non-Zionist now. You have remnants, you have, you have a few Hasidic groups, you have a few holdouts in, in America of classical reform rabbis who are still anti-Zionist. The American Council for Judaism was the group that they founded. But you're really talking about the end for all practical purposes of the debate over Zionism and the Jewish people worldwide becomes effectively Zionized in 1945. And I want to go back to that moment and ask the question again, why? What was it in Zionism that almost the entirety of the Jewish people intuitively embraced as the response to that particular moment? Now, of course, the obvious question is, well, the DPs, the Shoah, and the need for refuge. Yes, that was the obvious answer. But the argument that I will lay out for you today is that there were more subtle questions that the Shoah was raising to the Jewish people and more subtle answers that Zionism was giving. And that we're so focused on the refuge piece of Zionism and its response to the Shoah that we miss the profound ways in which Zionism really rose to the occasion. There is a much richer story to be told that we need to revisit before we let go of this story. Because more and more young Jews are giving up on this story and they're giving up, and this is the core of my argument, they are giving up on a story that we do not fully understand. We do not fully understand the depth and the power of what happened to the Jewish people on the day after the Shoah. And the truth is that Jews in the immediate post-Shoah era themselves most likely didn't understand the full complexity of what they were responding to. But intuitively, the wisdom, the collective wisdom of the Jewish people understood the, what the questions were and further understood that the only force in Jewish life that had the necessary responses to those questions was Zionism. And what I'm hoping to do today is to try to make what was implicit and intuitive for the generation after the Shoah explicit for us so that we can own that story more fully. Now, a couple of caveats before I unpack what I believe was actually happening in 1945. The first is that the Holocaust is not the reason why Israel exists. And I mentioned the, uh, the 
notion of the world's guilt, the Holocaust almost aborted the state of Israel because it destroyed the, the, uh, the largest reservoir of future citizens of the state of Israel, of people who were preparing to become citizens of the state of Israel. And if you read Ben-Gurion's diaries uh, in 1945, he said, it's over. This is it. This is the destruction of the state. It also didn't create the state, because, and this is something that is so not understood. The state already existed in 1945. The state of Israel that we celebrate today is not 74 years old. It's, 100, it's 140 years old. The state began to be created in the late 19th century. When it was founded in 1948, it was not created then. It was formally, it was formally recognized. The infrastructure was all there, culturally, politically. Everything that the Palestinians have failed to do so far, parenthetically, the Zionist movement succeeded in doing before there was a state. That's how you create a state. And so the Holocaust did not create the state of Israel. It almost destroyed the viability of the state. A majority of Jews today who live in the state of Israel have no family connection to the Holocaust. They their families fled or were expelled from one part of the Middle East, and they settled in another part of the Middle East. That's really important for American Jews to internalize. We're not first cousins anymore. It's part of the problem in the relationship. But we are not first cousins. Most Jews, most Israeli Jews, a majority, do not their, their, their grandparents and great-grandparents are not ethnically Ashkenazi. And um, nor is the story that I'm going to lay out to you um, about the impact of Zionism on the Palestinians. That's obviously a crucial story that we need to face, we are facing here. But we also need some space as a people where not everything is Israel slash Palestine where we're able to have some internal Jewish conversations about our story and our story on its own terms. And so I'm going to take us back to the moment when the Jewish people in 1945 is confronting the enormity of what has just happened. And bear in mind that the Jewish people kind of new, and I'm speaking about American Jewry primarily. There was information as early as 1942 in the American media. By 1944, it was certainly known. But the enormity of what had actually happened is only faced the moment when the American and, and Red Armies liberate the camps. What is the psyche of American Jews at that moment? I want to read to you two quotes. One is from Ben Hecht. Ben Hecht uh, was probably the great uh, American Hollywood screenwriter uh, of the 30s and 40s, uh, Gone with the Wind, uh, Front Page. Uh, ben Hecht um, famously or infamously, depends on your politics, uh, became head of the pro-Irgun movement in America and devoted much of his energies to, uh, to, to pro-right-wing uh, Zionist activity in the, in the 40s. And Ben Hecht wrote what I think is one of the great American Jewish autobiographies called The Child of the Century, really recommended. And here's what he has to say about that moment in 1945. I looked at the Jews around me trying to remain intact, but the intactness was gone. They were members of a tribe that had been gathered in a great bonfire without a friend in the world to cry shame or stop. That's Ben Hecht, on one end of the American Jewish experience, Hollywood. The most successful American Jews in 1945 are in Hollywood. 
On the other end of the spectrum is the future historian of the Shoah, Lucy Davidowitz, who in the 1940s is a young intern working in the New York office of YIVO. YIVO is the Institute for Research into Eastern European Jewry, Yiddish culture. And she's working in YIVO with refugee scholars who had managed to get out of Lithuania and elsewhere. And here's how she describes the atmosphere at the end of the war in the YIVO office in New York. We endured our despair in silence. It was as if these events were off limits for human intercourse, as if the world we had known and now read about had been sucked into a terrible pit. Dante's poetic vision of hell after death paled before the horrors of hell on earth we read about in the straightforward prose of news reporters. They were the witnesses who had glimpsed the end of the world. And so we have here two testimonies from, on the one hand, the refugee Yiddish community in New York and the Hollywood community uh, at, in 1945. Both are experiencing the exact same process. Now, the Jewish people in 1945 is internalizing the fact, and again, this is not happening consciously, but I believe it is happening deeply intuitively, is that the Jewish people in 1945 understands, or ex rather experience, not understands, experiences the Shoah as a four-pronged assault on Jewish being. The, and I'll briefly cite each of them and then unpack them, and then explain how Zionism met each of these four assaults. The first assault is physical. The Shoah not only destroys one out of every three Jews, or two out of every three European Jews, but the Shoah destroys the center of Jewish life at that time, which was European Jewry. The vital creative center is Europe. The second assault on the Jewish being is psychological. It, the Shoah is an existential threat to our self-confidence as a people, as a, as a people that has the ability to def, uh, defend itself, to, um, to, to, in the most minimal way, establish its place. The Shoah is also a, an assault on the 19th century Jewish notion that Jews could somehow gradually assimilate into the world, to whatever extent that the world was ready, or at least the West, was ready to accept us. Germany was the most beloved Jewish country. It was Germany. And, uh, and so the Jews in 1945 are experiencing an existential assault on their place in the world. Do the Jews belong to planet Earth, to the human species? And my father, as a survivor, would have certainly phrased it that way in 1945, because that's how I heard it from him in 1965. So the final assault of the Shoah on existential assault, assault is on the story Jews told themselves about who they are, the religious story of Judaism a story of a God who chooses the Jewish people, loves the Jews, protects the Jews. And this is a story that I can again tell you from personal experience, most survivors stopped believing in. And so let's, let's unpack, let's really look a little bit more deeply into each of these four assaults on the Jewish people, the Jewish psyche, the Jewish soul, and, um, and then look at the Zionist response to each of them. The physical assault is very simply this. At different moments in Jewish history, there are different periods where there are different centers. The center of gravity of Jewish life shifts 
Uh, for many centuries, it was in the Middle East. It was, it was in, in Babylonia, it was in Iraq. Then it shifted to Poland, it shifted to, to, to other parts of Europe. Uh, today, it has shifted again. In the mid 20th century, the center of creative Judaism, the, the part of the Jewish people that was most creatively struggling with modernity, with trying to find Jewish answers to modernity, was European Jewry. We live in the, in the mind of 19th and early 20th century European Jewry, still. The Jewish world that we inhabit is basically the world that European Jewry created, the ideological world that it created. And that world disappeared. And so the, 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 not only is this a question of losing a third of the Jewish people, it was losing the most creative third at that time. The psychological assault on Jewish self-confidence was summed up by a phrase that you know fortunately has been retired from uh, Jewish discourse, but when I was growing up was normative among survivors as well, which is we went like sheep to slaughter. When's the last time any of you have heard that? But it was normative in the 60s and even 70s. And it was Jews who spoke that way. And now, of course, we have a much more nuanced understanding of what resistance meant in the Shoah. Not everyone had to pick up a gun to actually fight back in different ways. There was cultural resistance, spiritual resistance. But that was not known. That, that was not a concept that we internalized. And certainly in 1945, that was not the immediate question that Jews were asking. The immediate question was, why are we such an, a, a dysfunctional people? Or as my father uh, would have put it, the, the Nazis were the perfect murderers and the Jews were the perfect victims. This was a, this was a meeting of, uh, uh, that was really meant to be. And um, I remember growing up with books in my home that desperately were trying to tell a story of Jewish heroism with titles like Jews Fight Too, exclamation mark. And the most telling part of that title is the exclamation mark. Now, or Jews fight back, or we, they fought back, we also fought back, maybe we fought back. And now, certainly, there is a paradox here because American Jewry fought back. A whole generation of young American Jews were combat soldiers. A whole generation of Soviet Jews were in the Red Army. But as a people, we hadn't been able to defend ourselves. And so there was this deep question, not necessarily of whether Jews are personally cowards, although that was definitely part of the psychic challenge that we were dealing with, but more profoundly whether this people is so inherently dysfunctional that it can't exist in this world as a collective. The assault on our place in the world is, of course, related to this assault on our self-confidence and our ability to defend ourselves, but it went deeper than that because what Jews in 1945 are grappling with is the revelation of the overwhelming hatred for the Jewish people. That what we always took for granted, yeah, you know, they, they kind of hate us, but the truth is through most of Jewish history, even though that's not the way we often read Jewish history retroactively, but the way it was experienced for most of Jewish history, we were pretty much left alone with periodic problems. But suddenly the Shoah is telling us a very different story. The hatred is so profound that every Jew in the world was marked for death penalty and every means was permitted and in fact every means was employed. It's the totality of the Shoah that is so stunning 
to Jews in 1945. The total and obsessive nature of the Shoah. Every Jew, every means. And so one response, one very natural response of Jews, and I think there were many more Jews who responded this way than we think, even many more survivors than we think, which was, I'm opting out of this thing. Not because I'm a coward, because I want to spare future generations the burden of having to go through this, having to carry this identity. My father came out of the war and made a decision, he will not have children. For that reason, he's not going to pass this on. As you can see, my mother had a different idea. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, when I go to Poland, and I, 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 Poland I, is a place that I, I like to visit quite often, uh, I meet some um, young people or the children of my generation who had no idea that their parents or grandparents, grandparents now, were survivors. Thousands of young Poles who are discovering this, which tells us that those survivors, never mind Jews and the rest of the diaspora, but those survivors who made the decision not to pass this on were m many more than we, than we think. And it is an understandable and entirely legitimate response in 1945. Now, there's an opposite response in 1945, and we're dealing with the consequences of that more and more, and that's the Haredi response. In 1945, it's a very, very small group, but very determined, and their argument is, well, wait a minute. What the Shoah tells us is, yes, we will never find our place, but no, those who have made that conclusion and decided to opt out of the Jewish people are wrong on two counts. First of all, they're wrong because they think that the Goyim are going to let them assimilate, and the Shoah proves that there is no possibility. And they're wrong because not only isn't there a possibility of assimilating, but there shouldn't be that option because the Shoah should tell us what they are. And we don't want to be part of them. That's the, Hare that's the depth of the Haredi move in 1945. And they have built their renaissance, this extraordinary renaissance, on that response in 1945. We don't want your culture. And the, um, there's a, and so the Haredim are voluntarily returning to the ghetto. You're, you, now, now you're ready to accept the Jews, now it's too late. Now we don't want to be accepted by you. There's a wonderful poem written by the Yiddish poet uh, Yaakov uh, Glatstein, uh, who, um, I'll read the first, the first line. Good night, wide world, big stinking world. Not you, but I slam shut the gate. Now, Yaakov Glatstein writes this poem in 1938, after Kristallnacht. And Glatstein is an interesting character because he was known uh, in, uh, the young, among the young Yiddish poets as the least Jewish. He was the one who believed that Yiddish needs to be cosmopolitan. Yiddish poetry needs to be like any other poetry and not reflect specifically Jewish ideas. After Kristallnacht, Yaakov Glatstein writes, good night, big stinking world. This line could be the motto for the Haredi Renaissance. That's what the Haredi Renaissance uh, adopts in 1945. And so what's under assault profoundly is the 19th and early 20th century ethos of much of European Jewry and American Jewry. Is it really possible to become part of the non-Jewish world in any fashion? This is an existential question 
for Lucy Davidowitz in New York and for Ben Hecht in Hollywood in 1945. The final of these four pronged assaults is spiritual, an assault on Judaism, on Jewish faith. Now, faith sustains us after the Churban in 2,000 years ago, after the destruction of the temple. It was faith that allowed us to continue. And we recite that uh, in, the, uh, in the prayer in Musaf. Um, on holidays, uh, because of our sins, we were exiled from the land. And there is this cycle of, of sin, punishment, forgiveness that is the basis of Jewish theology. This becomes untenable for most Jews in 1945. And the enormity of the Holocaust on Judaism is that it erodes the credibility of Jewish theology. And more deeply, it erodes the credibility of the Jewish story that we tell ourselves. And the Jewish story is based on the belief that God, the God of Israel, is a God who acts in history. It's not a God who acts primarily in nature. Yes, of course, nature reflects the glory of God, and we see that in the Psalms, it's in our prayers. But the deepest move, the most daring move of Judaism is to insist that not only can you find God's fingerprints in nature, but you can actually see God working in history. Now, why is this such a daring move? First of all, history is the last place that you would expect to really look for, for a God of mercy. And Judaism is saying, no, no, it's there. But there's an even more audacious move here because what the Jews are saying is, look to Jewish history to find God's fingerprints. Really? This story, the most powerless people on the planet, this people that's hated everywhere, that's pursued everywhere. Now the argument of Christianity and Islam was God is, has favored us, the story has moved in our direction because we won, we have power. They, God has rejected them. And the Jews are saying, no, just wait, just wait. Our day will come. The God of Israel is, you know, we sinned, we blew it, we have to pay the price. We're in, we're, we're in exile now. It's, we have a prison sentence that we have to serve out. When we serve out the term, we're coming back and the God of history is coming back. And then the Holocaust happens. And the Holocaust is the crowning moment of the exile. What does one say about the Holocaust? now? It gets even more interesting because the Nazis are not only acting out of racial motives, and this is something that I really want to emphasize. Nazism was a spiritual war against the God of Israel. And not only in the imagination of Jewish philosophers like Eliezer Berkowitz or Yitz Greenberg who really dealt with a post-Holocaust theology, but the Nazis themselves were conscious of declaring war against the God of Israel. For example, deportations would often be scheduled on Jewish holidays. The Nazis knew the Jewish calendar. The great deportation in the Warsaw Ghetto, 300, that began the 300,000 300, Jews being deported to Treblinka, begins on Tisha B'Av. The final destruction of the ghetto was supposed to begin on, on Seder night. It was thwarted by the revolt. But this is a pattern when one looks at, at the final solution, you see this running through. Uh, there was one uh, local Nazi commander in Poland uh, who won, uh, one Purim hung 10 Jews in revenge for the hanging of uh, Haman's 10 sons. Now this is a conscious spiritual war. This is the classic pagan taunt, the ancient pagan taunt, which, is, which we have in the Psalms. Uh, where is your invisible God? 
we see our God, you claim to have a God, well, he's nowhere. And the Nazis are taking this to its, the, 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 the final solution is meant to be a final solution for the God of Israel. And excuse me, I have to write that line down. Thank you for your indulgence. <laughs> and um, Auschwitz is the revelation of perfect evil. It is the creation of necropolis. Everything, it is the creation of a world that is meant entirely for death. Um, the, um, uh, one of the, the leading uh, Israeli historians on the Shoah who recently died, uh, Otto Dov Kulka, who was a boy in Auschwitz, he was 10 or 11, uh, and wrote uh, a, a, an extraordinary uh, memoir, uh, and he called it Landscapes of the Metropolis of Death. And what he's trying to say there is that when the Torah commands us, and you shall choose life. This is the antithesis. Auschwitz is the anti-Sinai. It is the revelation of the demonic. Now, we're not big in Judaism. We don't dwell on Satan. But if you're really looking at what Nazism consciously tried to do, it was to empower the satanic over the divine. And again, I'll quote uh, the Yiddish poet Yaakov Gladstein, and here he's writing about the, the Lublin ghetto in, during the Shoah. And he says, in Sinai we received the Torah, and in Lublin we gave it back. There's a um, wonderful historian uh, of the Shoah, Alon Confino, who wrote a book, called A World Without Jews. Uh, it was published about 10 years ago. I think it's Yale University Press. I, I think it's essential reading. It changed the way uh, I think about much of this. And he writes about Kristallnacht. And he says, we got Kristallnacht all wrong. The essence of Kristallnacht is not the destruction of Jewish shops. It isn't even the burning of the synagogues. It was the destruction of hundreds of Torah scrolls around Germany. And he says what, you, what happened in towns and villages all over the country was on Kristallnacht, they took out the Torah scrolls and they rolled them through the streets and people, the children rode their bicycles on them and then people tore them up and then they were burned. And he said, what is so radical about this move is that for 2,000 years, Christians never touched the Torah scrolls. If they would touch any Jewish scripture, it would be they would burn the Talmud, and then only rarely, Paris in the 13th century, rarely. For, for Christians, a Christian society to burn Torah scrolls en masse, and he says, what are they doing here? What, what, what are the Nazis doing? He says they are trying to train the German people to cross red lines. If you as a Christian can burn your own sacred text and to try, and, to, and the Nazis reimagined Christianity. They cre after Kristallnacht, they create the Institute for Aryan Christianity, which is to de-Judaize Christianity. But it begins on the night of what I would call the night of the desecrated scrolls. It's not the night of broken glass, it's the night of the desecrated parchment. That's what Kristallnacht actually is. And that's a spiritual war. That is a pagan war against the power of the God of Israel. We are going to expose the fact that the God of Israel is powerless and that the invisible God of Israel does not, in fact, exist. So let me read to you a, um, a short excerpt from the book I'm working on, which, which really tries to um, emphasize this point of the death blow, potential death blow to Judaism of the Shoah. 
A miracle is the capacity of reality to transcend its limits. By creating the unthinkable in Auschwitz, the Nazis had conjured a miracle. The last word on Jewish history belonged not to the prophets and their fairy tales of redemption, but to the apocalyptic fairy tales of the brothers Grimm. The dark forebodings of the Teutonic forest, Hansel and Gretel in the witch's oven, had proven far more robust in shaping the real world than the Jewish redemptive imagination. Wodan, the god of war, had vanquished the god of Israel. More than any event in the past, this was a death blow to the credibility of Judaism, to the ability of Jews to continue believing their own story. The final solution was a precise inversion of the Jewish redemptive fantasy. We believe that we had been chosen by God. Instead, we were chosen by the Nazis. Jews had been in gathered. We always believed that at the end of days, there would be this great in gathering of the Jewish people back to the land. Instead, there was this great in gathering of the Jewish people from every corner of Europe and parts of North Africa to Auschwitz. The world had filled with knowledge of God's absence, the anti-Sinai. Now, any one of these four assaults would have been form formidable. Together, they create an existential threat. The destruction of the, the vital center of Jewish life, the physical destruction, the undermining of our most basic self-confidence, our psychological self-confidence as a people, our ability to defend ourselves, uh, our belief that we could ever find a, a place in, within humanity, that we belong to humanity. Uh, and finally, the credibility of the Jewish story, the credibility of the God of Israel. Now, these are the questions that Jews are not necessarily asking explicitly. Some of them are being asked explicitly. All of them are being experienced on very deep levels. And I believe that the Jewish people become Zionist in 1945 because the Jewish people intuited that only Zionism had the capability, the tools, to push back on all four of these assaults. These are the questions that Zionism is actually asking. Why Israel? Zionism's answer is, answers in 1945 is Israel because of the following four responses to these assaults. First of all, the loss of the center of Jewish vitality, Jewish creativity. Zionism's response is we are actually, we have for the last 70 years, we have been in the process, you know, in, there's a, 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 a rabbinic phrase, uh, um, um, to, uh, to, uh, to, that you, you preempt the illness by first discovering the cure. That's what Zionism did in the late 19th century. It began creating the infrastructure for what would turn out to be the next center of Jewish cultural vitality. Zionism in 1945 tells the Jewish people, yes, we just lost that, but we actually are in the active process of creating the alternative. The loss of self-confidence in our ability to defend ourselves, enough said. Uh, there are no longer books published uh, with titles like Jews Fight Back. Uh, if anything, the critique is we've, we've learned to fight too well. That seems to be the problem that much of the world uh, is concerned about. Uh, Jews are no longer uh, ridiculed as cowards, but now we're aggressors. And to have moved from the world symbol of cowardice to the world symbol of aggression in like two generations is, a, is a one of the great accomplishments of Jewish history. 
<clears throat> and should I write that line down too? <laughs> and, uh, and you know, the very fact that we have a generation of young Jews, um, mostly in the diaspora, some here as well, who are questioning the need, the legitimacy of Jewish power is the greatest victory of Zionism. That Jews feel so safe and so confident that we're able to ask ourselves, well, do we really need this? I can assure you that there was not a single Jew alive in 1945 who asked that question. And, uh, and I honestly, if my father were alive today, I, I don't know what he would do, what he would say about the Jews who are asking that question. Sometimes I feel him in me. I try to suppress my father in those moments. It's not a Hartman conversation if I go, with, if I go there. <laughs> so, in, so those are, okay, creating, creating the next center for Jewish civilization, restoring Jewish self-confidence in our ability as a people to defend ourselves, the psychological self-confidence. Mm -hmm. And this next point is, I think, especially significant for the relationship that developed at that time between American Jewry and the Zionist movement, and that is restoring our belief, the 19th century Jewish belief, that the Jewish people, despite the Holocaust, can find its place in the family of nations. And after the Shoah, as, as we indicated earlier, after the Shoah, there were two extreme responses. There was the extreme assimilationist response, which is, I'm out of here. You know, I, I get it. I see the price for this identity. And as much as, you know, I love, you know, bagels are great, it's not worth risking um, my family. Uh, it's, Auschwitz is not a price that I'm worth willing to pay for some ethnic feel-good identity. So I'm out. I'm out. Doesn't mean enough to me to take that risk. The other, at the other extreme, I'm out of humanity. The world, quote, there's the Jews and the world. And growing up, that's how I heard about, you know, there's us and there's the world. We're not really part of the world. And I grew up thinking of the Jews as kind of a separate species, almost. And that's, that was the Haredi response. And, and I grew up in Borough Park, which was emerging as the American capital of the Haredi response. In a Zionist family, we were the, we were the, uh, the, the not so loyal opposition to the Haredi uh, renaissance that was emerging around us. But I experienced that and I, I lived that, that mentality. There was a middle path what I would call the Zionist path. And that was the path that American Jewry overwhelmingly endorsed. And that path was that the Holocaust is not only the culminating experience of exile, it is also the end of exile. That the Holocaust is the moment when the Jewish people realized that what is untenable is Jewish radical otherness. We cannot continue to live in a state of total or near total separateness from the rest of the world. We don't want to be there anymore. And that was what most Jews, most survivors, most survivors did not become Haredi. Most survivors became Zionist. The argument of Zionism was, we are going to renegotiate the Jewish relationship with the world by entering Assi and I use the word assimilating, in a, to me in a positive sense. We, are, and the, when the Haredim critiqued Zionism as assimilationists, they were right. Because the Zionist move was, we want to be part of the world, despite the Holocaust and because of the Holocaust. We don't want to be in a position where we're going to be singled out in that way anymore. We want to, what was the Zionist phrase? What are we going to do to the Jewish condition? We're going to normalize the Jews. Now in 1945, 
to talk about normalizing the Jews was messianic. The Haredim said, no, that's a betrayal of messianism, of Jewish exceptionalism. But for survivors in 1945, to the idea that the Jews could actually become a normal people, part of the world, that was a, an idea that belonged to, to, to the end of days. That was a messianic idea. And so Zionism says, we are going to join the international community, but we're not going to do it on the 19th century European Jewish model of each individual Jew navigating their own entry point into non-Jewish society. We're going to do it as a collective. We are going to, be, to become part of the family of nations as a Jewish nation, a nation among nations. That's the Zionist move. The American Jewish move is similar, but it's playing out in an American Jewish context, which is we are going to enter the American public space as a proud and unself-conscious minority with its own political agenda, its needs, and we will insist on our place as an organized Jewish community. Now, of course, there was an organized Jewish community before the Shoah, but the community that we really recognize today that is part of the free-for-all in the American public space really begins to gradually emerge after the Shoah in conjunction with Israel's emergence. Think of the two flags on the bima of most American synagogues. The intuition of American Jews in the 40s and 50s is that these are the two flags of the Jewish uh, Renaissance of the Jewish ability to defeat the Shoah, it's these two flags working together. It's American Jewry and it's, and it's Zionism. And that's how we defeat the Shoah. By joining the international community, again, each in a different way, as a sovereign Jewish state here, as a strong minority in America, and that is how we enter the post-Holocaust Jewish world. That's the mainstream of Israel, American Jewry, and most of the diaspora. This is happening all over the diaspora. And again, I call this a kind of a path of soft assimilation or assimilation with Jewish dignity, which the Haredim, of course, see as betrayal. But we are here, and this institute exists to defend that 1945 move of the Jewish people that we actually believe that that was the right Jewish move to figure out a way to assimilate despite the Holocaust and because of the Holocaust as Jewish collectives. Finally, the assault on faith, on the credibility of the God of Israel, the God of history. Just to make one or two points here that I, I, just to strengthen that argument of what I mean by Judaism as the religion of history. That if you think about our holidays, our holidays are historic events. Now, of course, they were agricultural events, but they were reinterpreted or merged together with historic events. I'm just talking about our ancient holidays. And uh, while I was writing this book, uh, I was struggling with the fact that, well, okay, that's true, but what about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? Those aren't historical events. And then I was reading Salo Baron, the great American Jewish historian, and there it is in his introduction to his 20-volume book, which I did not read, but I did read the introduction. And, uh, and what he says in the introduction is Judaism is the religion of history. It, it is the notion that God acts in history. Judaism begins with a moment of history, which is creation. I mean, you know, we think of creation as prehistory, but his argument is no, it's happening in this world. And so day one of Judaism is the creation of the world. And then the Jewish story continues through history and, and according, Judaism understands the Jewish people as, as, as a people that is created to be a kind of catalyst or a quickener within human history to move humanity closer to the denouement of history, the culminating moment, which is redemption. In other words, history has a beginning, a middle, and an end. 
It's a story. That is the Jewish religious story of the world. And, um, and, so, and then Selo Baron says, uh, well, Rosh Hashanah, is, is, that's the first day of history. Judaism is, is anchoring itself in history. And then I think, well, what about Yom Kippur? And he says, well, he's answering my question. He says, Yom Kippur is, is actually not just the forgiveness of each Jew, but primarily it's the experience of the collective forgiveness of the Jewish people. That's how Yom Kippur was experienced in ancient times. And so there's something powerful here that's working out. We are the religion of history, which means, and this is where it gets, it gets dicey, the credibility of Judaism ultimately is tested in history. Now, the argument of Judaism for millennia was, don't freeze the frame, we're a work in progress. But the Holocaust comes along, and that's a pretty definitive moment about the God of Israel, about the credibility of the ingathering, all of those mythic notions, our chosenness. And, um, and so to ignore the religious challenge of Auschwitz is to seed history as the arena, not of the divine, but of the demonic. That the demonic has greater power than the divine in history. And so what we needed in 1945 was a mythic counterweight to Auschwitz. Auschwitz is not just a physical problem or a psychological problem for the Jews. It is a mythic problem for the Jews. It is a challenge to the mythic notion of a god of history. And so Zionism's response here is to conjure up the only event in Judaism that would have the mythic force to, to, to respond to Auschwitz. And that is the return to Zion, bringing Jews back to this land from a hundred different countries, which was such an inconceivable fantasy that for 2,000 years, Jews gave that job to the Messiah. Nobody else could do it. Only the Messiah could. Why did the Haredim initially oppose Zionism? Who are you to be doing God's job? You think you can do this thing? Only God and the Messiah can do this. And Zionism is there in 1945 with the mythic counterweight to Auschwitz. Not the solution to Auschwitz. There is no, I believe personally, there is no theological solution to Auschwitz. But there is at least a balance that suddenly what Zionism does by, by, by uh, implementing the Jewish redemptive fantasy is essentially telling the Jewish people that the God of Israel is not yet out of the picture. It may, there may still be credibility for the God of Israel. And again, it's not a knockout. Auschwitz stands. The Nazi achievement of creating necropolis, the anti-Auschwitz, the, the, the anti-Sinai. There's, there's the revelation of Sinai, and then there's the anti-Sinai. And this is, some, this is actually something that's very personal for me because uh, in my family, we commemorated my grandparents' death on Shavuot. The trains from their town in Hungary reached Auschwitz on Shavuot, which means that their town was destroyed on Shavuot. And so the survivors of my father's town decided Shavuot is when we commemorate their town. And so for me, this is very personal. And, um, and it's, it's, it's funny, you know, I just, this Shavuot was, was really a, a, was a very rich time for me personally because I started putting all of these pieces together and, and realizing I'm named for someone who was killed in Auschwitz on Shavuot. And so this is all this, you know, why am I so interested in this material? I obviously should have realized this and maybe I shouldn't have stopped going to a psychologist, you know, uh, 30 years ago. But, uh, but, but yes, you know, I, this, so what, I, what we experienced in my family 
And that was always there, you know, there's Shavuot, and we're talking about receiving the Torah, but there are the yard side candles, you know, on Shavuot saying there's another, there's another story here about revelation. There's an anti-revelation. And so the revelation of the return to Zion doesn't, doesn't erase, which is one of the arguments I have with many religious Zionists. You know, they'll say, oh, that's, you know, we, we, it's, it's, Israel is the answer. Well, Israel may be an answer, but the greatness of Zionism in 1945 is that it allows Jews to say, maybe this story isn't over yet. Maybe it's possible to still pray. Now, I have to tell you that growing up in Borough Park and growing up among survivors, most of whom uh, went on to become pillars of the Haredi community, my father's friends, and my father was always kind of the, the black sheep among them. But we used to daven in a Haredi shtibel, a little Haredi synagogue in Borough Park. And what I remember from that synagogue is that nobody davened. Nobody. This, is, this was a, a synagogue that was close in, in, in sociologically and maybe even theologically to Satmar. The only person who davened there was the Rebbe. That was his job. And I've been, you know, I've been to some American synagogues where that's true as well. <laughs> it's, the, it's the cantor's job to pray for everyone. And, uh, and in the 1960s, survivors that I experienced in the heart of the Haredi world were not davening. They were talking about business, they were laughing and joking, and it was the Rebbe's job to run through the davening. Nobody prayed. I do not take Jewish prayer for granted. The fact that Jews can pray today without irony, I think, is an extraordinary victory. It is the vindication of Zionism. Now, it's tricky here because Zionism did not intend to do this. We're talking about secular Zionism. Secular Zionism, Ben-Gurion had no interest in salvaging the credibility of the God of Israel. Quite the opposite. If anything, Ben-Gurion thought he was burying, he was freeing the Jews from the God of Israel. But sometimes history plays tricks on, uh, on, on what we think we're doing. And um, nevertheless, I say this because it's also, it's important for two reasons. It's important to recognize that Zionism did not intend to do this. Religious Zionism did. Secular Zionism, which was the overwhelming weight of Zionism, did not intend to do this. And I'm also mentioning this because this is dangerous ground theologically. It's dangerous ground in ways that we see happening in Israeli society every day. If you equate the state of Israel with the theological response to Auschwitz, if you're saying God is in the state, we have the settlement movement, we have Gush Emunim, we, we have a certain theological mindset. The Hartman Institute was founded by David Hartman in large part to push back against this idea that I'm sitting here promoting. And so, we have to really be very careful. This is theological dynamite. And we, and we today are paying an enormous price as a people for this victory. The problem is that a religion that has for 4,000 years told itself a story about itself that is grounded in history cannot ignore when the most extraordinary historical events actually happen to it. It couldn't ignore the, the Shoah, and it couldn't ignore the state of Israel. Now, who does theologically ignore these events of the mid-20th century? Which major group in the Jewish people ignore, the religious group ignores them? The Haredim. The Haredim say, history doesn't matter. The Haredim, what I regard as the great Haredi heresy is ahistorical Judaism. And that plays out in their rejection of modernity. It plays out in their rejection of the move, that the Zionist move that American Jewry and Israel made together, the two flags on the bima, 
that history evolves and the Jewish people evolves with it. The Haredim decided to freeze Jewish history to 1939. That's where they want to live, and that's the only history that matters. And that, to my mind, negates the logic, the essence of Judaism as the religion of history, which is the religion of the evolution of humanity, the religion of the evolution of the Jewish people. So re the religion of history cannot ignore the mythic when the mythic actually becomes, when the mythic materializes. How you reign in the mythic, how you control the consequences of the mythic is exactly what we're kind of doing at the Institute with all of you this week. We're dealing with the consequences of the mythic gone wild in parts of Israeli society. And, um, and how do we recapture the Zionist story of 1945? That's not our topic today, but it's an important insertion. Let me, uh, if I may, read a, another brief excerpt from what I'm working on. What survivors intuited in 1945 was that the credibility of the Jewish story was now at stake. The final solution required a drastic change in the survival, in the strategy of Jewish survival. In the past, when Jews faced calamity, they patiently rebuilt. Expelled from one country, they resettled in another. But this time, mere perseverance would not be enough. And this is very much against the Haredi model, which is continuing the pattern of 2,000 years, mere perseverance. Left unchallenged, the final solution would become the most powerful event in Jewish history, eclipsing for many Jews the mythic power of the distant revelation of Sinai. Thanks for the inspiration. The Jews risked forfeiting history to the demonic imagination. The vitality, the credibility of Judaism required a reassertion of the spiritual relevance of history. And if many Jews in 1945, and I would say most survivors, were incapable of affirming the existence of an eternal and all-powerful God of Israel, they could still affirm the eternity of the people of Israel. To resist the power of the apocalyptic imagination required a mythic counterweight as stunning, as improbable as the final solution itself. Only a redemptive act happening visibly in history before the world could challenge the Nazi success in proving the reality of an empty and absurd universe. That role was fulfilled by the return to Zion a prospect that Jews had considered so far-fetched that only the Messiah, a force outside of history, could manage it. The genius of Jewish survival in 1945 is that just as Jews most need faith and, tradition, and just as traditional faith had become most elusive, a secular movement fulfilled key elements of Jewish belief, however unintentionally secular Zionism steps into that role. In this war between the apocalyptic and the redemptive imaginations, the final solution could not be entirely defeated. The apocalyptic imposition on history had become too powerful to deny. Still, survivors intuited, it could at least be challenged. The impossible dream against the inconceivable nightmare by responding to the Holocaust with a no less astonishing historical event, the restoration of Jewish power from the point of total Jewish defeat and the ingathering of the exiles, survivors, survivors helped restore the capacity of the Jewish story to define itself on its own terms. It restored its capacity for wonder, wonder at its own story. 
The fact that the counter assault against the Nazi imagination was happening through a largely secular Zionism that had no interest in validating religious claims did not detract from its mythic force. Its very secular expression was what allowed Jews like my father to embrace transcendent history without being forced to acknowledge God's presence in the story. And as my father put it, he said, um, after the Shoah, I stopped praying because God didn't deserve my prayers. It's a very Jewish response. It's not that I don't believe in God. He doesn't deserve my prayers. And then after the Six Day War, my father said, now I can pray to God again. It's very practical. It's very business. My father was a businessman. Zionism also offered an antidote to the crisis of Jewish faith in modernity. Industrialized mass murder could happen only in modern times, but so too the political organization of the Jews and their return home. Zionism then not only restored the credibility of the God of history, but of the redemptive capacity of secular modernity. This is where we part company, all of us in this room with the Haredim. Instead of seeing modernity as Auschwitz and their right, but they're only half right, because the other half is that the Jewish reality that we know today, the strongest experience of Jewish sovereignty in our history and the strongest diaspora in our history happening simultaneously, that's also the expression of modernity. And so modernity is the greatest curse and the greatest blessing. And if you think of, translate that into science and the world of science that we live in, the consequences of modernity are either the greatest curse or the greatest blessing. And so uh, the way we experience modernity in our history is how the world today is experiencing modernity. <sighs> Insisting on Jewish normalization, in 1945, at this of all moments, Zionism was salvaging the possibility of Jewish transcendence, of the mythic credibility of Judaism. The wisdom of Jewish survival in 1945 is to understand that mere survival was no longer enough, that the time had come to test the basic premises of the Jewish story to go for broke. In its blurring of the secular and the sacred was the holy deception of Zionism, the redemptive masquerading as the mundane, one last chance for the Jewish people to dream in history. So, to conclude, and there has to be a God because I had no idea how long this was going to be and it actually is concluding according to our schedule. <laughs> the, Again, to go back to the two flags on the bima, which we take for granted, and I grew up thinking of that as kind of a kind of hokey. Those, the entwinement of those two flags and what it represents is precisely what's under assault today. The legitimacy of that entwinement, and we need to go back to 1945 to understand why those two symbols became entwined why American Jews became Zionists in the first place before they give up on Zionism just yet. And it was the intuition of American Jews, and this is such a strange thing, when you think of those two flags, they're not only on the bima, they're at the most sacred place, they are flanking the ark. And that was the intuition of American Jews, that these two flags embody something of the sacred. And the sacred is the eternity of the Jewish people. That's what those flags are embodying. Not necessarily the eternity of God. In, in the 1940s and 50s, that's not what's in the minds of American Jews. And I'm just reading a, a terrific memoir now by a guy named uh, Friedman. I forget his first name. I think it's Robert Friedman, um, who, um, was for many years the legendary head of the UJA, uh, Herbert, Herbert. And it's a fantastic memoir. Uh, 
It's called Roots of the Future. Ah, oh, it's, it's magnificent. And if you really want to understand 1945, first of all, he was a chaplain uh, in the DP camps in 1945. And then he's writing about the post-war years. And there's one fantastic moment where he's writing about his decision to become a rabbi. And he writes, this had nothing to do with religion. He said, that, he said, I didn't have a religious epiphany. It's 1940, the Jewish people is facing an existential moment, and I want to become a servant of the Jewish people. And he said, I need a pulpit. And he said, ah, they actually literally have a pulpit. So I'm going to become a rabbi. And the two flags are up there for the same reason that Herbert Friedman becomes the rabbi on that pulpit, because it's the eternity of the Jewish people that's at stake. And the eternity of the Jewish people becomes the means through which the Jews slowly make their peace with the eternal God of Israel. Sorry. Okay, look, I'm gonna have to name each of you in the acknowledgement, so. <laughs> So let me really, let me conclude. I'll just really try to sum this up in the following way. In 11 years from now, which is really not a long time, 2033, humanity is going to be observing the centenary of the Nazi rise to power. Now, when I realized that recently, I almost stopped breathing because 100 years Think of what 100 years ago was. From when I was growing up, 100 years ago was the Civil War. That really was ancient history. The Holocaust is going to be 100 years ago. And so the answers that we, many of us here, grew up with have to change. The Holocaust is transitioning from living wound to historical memory. What is it that we need to readjust in our memory as a people? What is the Holocaust going to be? And my argument is that we need to shift the emphasis of Holocaust memory and identity from what I, where I opened this talk, that we are not only the people that endured the Holocaust, we are not even primarily the people that endured the Holocaust, but the people that overcame the Holocaust. That's the core. And we need to own the identity of survivor people. We need to begin consciously seeing ourselves as a survivor. We are a survivor people, but not in the sense of a traumatized people, the opposite. We're the people that actually outwitted history. We are the people that, that of history. We are the religion of history. We figured it out. And we figured it out in 1945, and we figured it out through the two flags on the Bema. And so, when we talk about, you know, remember uh, that you were slaves in Egypt. We're supposed to remember that we were slaves in Egypt. But the only time we're ever told to actually imagine ourselves in relation to that story is not, we're never told, imagine as if you yourself were a slave in Egypt. Remember that you were slaves. You, your ancestors were slaves. But to imagine that you yourself is when? Leaving. Egypt. Now, why is that? The slavery doesn't belong to those who didn't experience it. We're never told, imagine yourselves to be slaves in Egypt. We're never told, we, we, we will never be survivors of Auschwitz in that sense. We will never be those who experienced Auschwitz. But every Jew beginning in 1945 left Auschwitz. And we are part of the ongoing story of leaving Auschwitz. It's an ongoing story. In the way that leaving Egypt is an ongoing story, our ongoing story now has to be leaving Egypt, even more than leaving, uh, leaving, Egypt, leaving Auschwitz even more immediately than leaving Egypt.
um, leaving Sinai. Now, what that means is that the story of 1945 is what really belongs to us. That's the story we have to understand. It's the story we have to defend because that's the story that's under assault now. The legitimacy of the Jewish defeat of the Shoah through Zionism, through the American Jewish Israeli Alliance, that's the story that's under assault now. But in order to defend that story, we need first of all to understand the depth of what actually happened. We need to own that story. And, uh, and that's the way from that place, I believe we'll be able to deal with whatever is coming. So thank you all very much. Please to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.